As COVID-19 continues to take a harsh toll, many are pinning their hopes on vaccines developed in record time. And yet in many parts of the world, their rollout has been patchy at best. With deliveries from some manufacturers falling short of what was agreed, Europe is squabbling with the pharmaceuticals industry over who's to blame. Some poorer countries find themselves shut out altogether in the vaccine scramble. Many of their citizens may have to wait as long as two years to get the jab. The World Health Organization warns no one is safe until everyone is safe. But how do we ensure access for all? The race for COVID vaccines, rich against poor? Welcome to To The Point. It's my pleasure to introduce our guests, beginning with Mekonen Miskena. He is head of migration and diversity at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. And he says, what this pandemic demonstrates once again is the global epidemic of injustice that we never managed to bring under control. And I'm very pleased to welcome to the program Frank Ulrich Montgomery. He is president of the World Medical Association. And he thinks, the vaccine was developed in record time. Supply chain bottlenecks are perfectly normal. A vaccine for hundreds of millions of people isn't something you just pluck from thin air. And we're very pleased to have with us, joining us from Brussels, uh, Alexandra von Namen. She heads DW's studio there, and she says, with the EU scrambling to vaccinate its own citizens and the US absent as a global player, China and Russia are winning the vaccine diplomacy race. So let's start right here in uh, Germany, Dr. Montgomery. Germany has just decided to extend its lockdown, although in fact, in fact infection rates have been dropping and vaccine availability is on the rise. Is that caution on the part of the government justified? It is a, a very important caution. It is very much justified because although figures drop, they drop too slow. And we know that if we start from a too high level to go back into normal life, we will be up very quickly again. And the third wave of the disease will be much worse than the first and the second. So I think it's a good policy. Let me come back to that WHO motto that I quoted a moment ago, that no one is safe until everyone is safe. The fact is that a number of Germany's neighboring countries are easing restrictions. So will Germany's tighter lockdown really be effective under those circumstances? It will definitely be effective, but it could be even more effective if we would have a sort of European solidarity by all doing the same things. But uh, it, I think it's worthless to discuss that at this moment now because uh, it simply is not there. Mm -hmm. And we'll come but back it to would, why. It would help a lot. And we'll come back to why it's not there in, in uh, a few moments. But let me first uh, go to Mikon and Muscana and ask you, uh, about the situation also uh, in terms of global equity. Germany's chancellor frequently points out that we are all in this together, essentially that WHO motto once again. And last fall, she appealed to the G20 to do far more to ensure fair distribution of a vaccine. Are you seeing any evidence, both here in this country, in Europe and internationally, of real action to mitigate what your statement referred to as an epidemic of injustice? Mm. Well, I truly believe that there is the intention uh, to uh, work more on in solidarity and also to have a better distribution. Practically, I don't see any uh, actions on the ground because uh, since uh, last March, uh, many of the African countries in Asia and Latin America has been um, uh, fighting on on a, on a sole ground without any uh, sanitation, with uh, you know lack of resources, uh, let alone uh, with with other any high developed vaccine and so on. So what I see is there is an intention to always think. Uh, uh, the poor within the context of uh, uh, sharing the resources we have. But uh, looking into what has been done so far, I don't see any uh, encouraging actions. So I'm, I'm uh, so far pretty much uh, pessimistic. 
Again, we will come back uh, to dig a bit deeper on that. But let me go now to Brussels. And Alexandra, as I mentioned, even in Europe, there are disparities, both between the containment approach and in the vaccine rollout. The EU Commission has repeatedly pledged that the EU must act as one. But the reality on the ground is pretty different, isn't it? Yes, you're right. It is different how uh, member states are handling their pandemic, what measures uh, they already introduced or are about to introduce. Uh, and the problem is that, as we can see now, uh, uh, with uh, you know the EU scrambling to get enough vaccines for each member state, uh, that's of course something that you can understand, that they see the problems and now they doubt that uh, such a united Europe can really handle the pandemic. So I think I think that's that's a real issue and if it's important now to make sure that the European Union will get enough vaccines for each member state to make sure that uh, everyone is on track to vaccinate its citizens so that uh, member states uh, now again will believe that it's uh, a right way to uh, to do it together and to show solidarity because we are in this uh, together indeed pointing out the enormous importance of uh, political trust uh, and confidence uh, there. Again, something we'll come back to in a moment. But let's first take a look at where things stand in Europe at the moment. As we've heard, the speed with which the COVID vaccines were developed is a startling advance, and it sparked hopes that we'd soon put the pandemic behind us. But those hopes have given way to anxious competition and envious recrimination. The UK is vaccinating people faster than any other country in Europe. On December 2nd, 2020, it became the first country in the world to grant emergency authorization for the COVID-19 vaccine from BioNTech and Pfizer. The UK government signed deals for the vaccine last July. The EU didn't manage that until months later. It waited for the normal authorization procedure before starting inoculations. In January, an order for 300 million more doses was placed. The EU's vaccination rate has been disappointing despite newly approved jabs from AstraZeneca and Moderna. Too little, too late? The EU Commission faces harsh criticism for its vaccine rollout. Orders in the name of the 27 member states have been placed with several companies, but only a few of them can deliver. And Eastern European countries seem to want to save money, and France wants to prioritize its own drug companies. The Commission blames pharma companies for delayed deliveries. The companies, on the other hand, claim limited production capacity is responsible. Who is to blame for the EU's vaccine dilemma? Let me put that question straight away to Dr. Montgomery, coupled with uh, a question or a, a criticism that we're often hearing at the moment in regard to the negotiations uh, between the EU Commission and uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Some critics are saying that the EU prioritized cost over speed of delivery. Do you think that's right? And even if it did, would there be some justification to that? Um, I would say we know today it wasn't right, but it was justified at that moment because countries, poorer countries in the European Union couldn't pay the price uh, which was called up by companies like Pfizer uh, and also the judicial background of, uh, of, um, of litigation, etc., was very heavily on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. So at the time when the negotiations went on, the European Union had to discuss prices and delivery um, schedules with the, the companies. Today, we know that uh, it would have been much cheaper to invest more money in vaccines and save money on the lockdowns, uh, which are so harmful to our economies and to our industries. So, but as uh, Ustinov, Peter Ustinov once said, I, I always like to talk to profits three years later. <laughs> And I think that is the problem we have now. We are past the stage. It has been a mistake. Now we have to make the best of it. What Dr. Montgomery just described, McConnell, is a bit of that dilemma of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Some critics say the EU should have been more aggressive, competed harder against countries like the United States. Others say Europe is too selfish, prioritizing EU interests over those of poorer countries. What's your take? Well, the idea of solidarity is uh, the right track. I think uh, Europe did actually the way how it has been dealing 
you know, as a common region uh, and also uh, thinking of the poor ones and those who have and who have not, I think that was the right track. But we should extend this globally as well. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, now we have, uh, you know, like uh, we did it, each of us, like hamster purchase uh, on a daily basis. And that's Hoarding. exactly... Hoarding, yeah. Exactly. And that's exactly what's happening uh, when we see into the number of vaccines which has been ordered. It will outnumber us in any way. Okay, uh, Europe has ordered around 2.3 million vaccines for 448 uh, uh, citizens and the population, which is one to five. Uh, UK has over 400 million vaccines for its 68 million uh, population, which is around uh, six vaccines to one citizen. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, troubles me when we look into the global um, uh, situation where we have regions where they don't have even just a vaccine uh, per citizen or uh, let alone uh, 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 twice and so on. So I think the, the, the idea of solidarity uh, of the EU, that is the way how we should also handle on a global way. Although I know that some countries have been more aggressive, uh, like uh, UK uh, or Trump or Israel, also how they dealt uh, the beginning with the price politics and so on. So they are so far successful, but when we think on a more regional and global way, uh, national uh, uh, solutions were never uh, the best way to deal with pandemic. Alexandra, staying in Europe uh, just uh, for the time being, would you say that Brussels and EU member states have done enough to ensure equity of distribution of a vaccine within Europe? I, I think, yes, that that's what was the goal of uh, going together and uh, procuring vaccines together. And uh, this was rightly uh, the goal, because uh, now we are hearing from uh, poorer countries within the European Union uh, praising this approach and saying uh, we are happy because otherwise we wouldn't have had uh, vaccines at all. Uh, on the other hand, we have to say that that was, of course, a reason for the European Union to move slowly, uh, much slower than the UK, for example, or Israel. And mistakes were made. That was EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, said repeatedly. Uh, we were too, too late uh, granting authorization. We were too optimistic with regard to mass production of vaccines. And we were also too naive, maybe, to believe that everything will arrive in time, but still I think uh, this approach uh, to, to uh, procure vaccines together uh, so that everyone uh, will have eventually enough of them to inoculate its population was the right step, the right decision to do. Dr. Montgomery, your opening statement says that supply, locked, uh, supply uh, shortages are standard, they're normal, and you're essentially cautioning everybody to just be patient. And in fact, we do hear that there will be a great more vaccine coming online in the second and third quarters of this year. But the question is, how much time do we have? How quickly do we need to get that vaccine into people's arms in view of these new mutations? Oh, we should have done that months ago. But we are not talking of a uh, of a cookery uh, res recipe somewhere. We are talking of a highly complex uh, chemical product, uh, which is uh, produced. Uh, uh, sometimes it takes more than three months to produce a single molecule of this uh, vaccine, and there, a lot of things can go wrong during the production line. I remember a year when the whole range of influenza vaccines uh, uh, were, were were destroyed for a simple technical uh, mistake, and therefore we must be fair with the companies as well. And we must also realize that some of the, the very prominent uh, factories that produced in the past, like Sanofi Aventis, totally failed on producing a vaccine up to now. And so they are now offering their production plans to the other producers to produce more vaccine. But it is not like, it's not like a switch which you turn around and one day you produce uh, vaccine A and the next day vaccine B. It takes up to three months to build up a production line. And this has mere technical reasons. So if you buy vaccines, 2.3 billion doses of vaccines, to imagine that they're all there in the first quarter of 2021 is an illusion. Do you ever worry that we are relying too much on the idea of a vaccine as a kind of silver bullet, the bullet that will solve all of our problems? 
Given those mutations, the Chancellor has said we could be looking at a situation where we have to vaccinate people anew every year. As we do with influenza. I have no other silver or golden bullet in, bullet in my uh, gun. It's the only thing we have. There is no direct therapy against uh, uh, the coronavirus. There is a, a coming vaccination, and we have to be quick with the vaccination because the more people undergo the infection, the more mutations will form in these infected people. So our chance is to get as many people vaccinated as fast as possible, also to avoid mutations. And of course it can happen that there is a mutation coming out, a variant, variant that is more dangerous than the present variants, um, and then we have another problem. But we solve problems when they are there. Hmm. Uh, and that's, that's why I think we need, you know, an urgent global strategy. Even we cannot live in a, in a permanent lockdown. Even if we vaccinate every citizen here and then at one point try... Uh, you know, like open everything and then and start traveling and so on. So if we have this injustice, if we have this imbalance globally, then we'll fall down again to the same situation. That's why I think not only uh, on, on, on the basis of vaccination, but on the basis of keeping all people safe uh, globally. I think this is another approach why we should think, you know, like in, in a far... Uh, far, far far-sighted politics rather than you know like we vaccine every citizen and then we are out but far-sighted politics if, if i just may say that our politicians in europe are under extreme stress from their public mm. uh, so once we have started real vaccination campaigns and have a sufficient amount of people vaccinated here then i'm sure we will extend our solidarity towards other countries but it is over expecting politicians in the European region if you think uh, uh, they would sort of hand it out first to other nations out of solidarity, they have to look after their own citizens as well. Let me come back to that in just a moment, but uh, take to uh, Alexandra uh, the question of vaccination becoming a political football, because indeed uh, it's become a very political issue, both within Europe and beyond. Now, we are seeing some European countries actually turning to China and Russia for vaccines. Serbia, Hungary. Is this simply good health policy on the basis of the, sh the supply shortages uh, that uh, are currently there, or is there more, uh, more at work here? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that China and Russia are, of course, uh, watching closely what's happening in the European Union and how the EU is struggling to get enough vaccines. And uh, they uh, started last year offering their vaccines to Africa, to Asia, to South America. And now even in Europe's neighborhood, you have countries like uh, Serbia, for example, who are more than happy to uh, get uh, Russian and uh, Chinese-made vaccines because they are so desperate to inoculate their citizens because they were promised by the European Union that help would come, but there is nothing to see it. And even within the European Union, with Hungary, for example, who approved the Chinese vaccine, one of them, and who also is using uh, Sputnik V, you see that uh, China and Russia, with their strategy presenting themselves as a savior of as saviors of the world, uh, they are quite successful, even in the European Union. Hungary, of course, is an outlier in other respects within the EU at the moment uh, as well. Is this a political statement on the part of Hungary that it's uh, looking to these countries for support on vaccines? And what do you think are the implications for relations within the EU, briefly, if you would? Yeah, so we have to, of course, consider that Hungary has always had good relations with Moscow, historically speaking. But this is very embarrassing for the European Union because it also shows that uh, uh, it was not as successful as it uh, claimed to be uh, securing enough vaccines for the European Union. Let me take the same question uh, on to McConnell. Uh, China is also offering to supply vaccines uh, widely across Africa. Mm. What would you say would be the long-term political implications of that? Well, I think that's part of the long-term strategy of uh, China expanding to uh, African uh, continent uh, at a prolonged uh, 
uh, strategy of its economic expansion as well. China uh, reacted already last year in uh, April, sending uh, cargoes with sanitation and masks and so on uh, to some regions. Uh, they sent, for example, a number of cargoes to uh, Ethiopia as, as a hub to distribute uh, uh, sanitation in the region. And they did it in Southern Africa, in Western Africa, and so on. So it's just a symbolic politics. Uh, but however, uh, it, it has been there. And uh, it was at the time when there was nothing there. Uh, and that, that would happen uh, with the vaccination as well. If there is nothing, then people will take that, what they, what they get. And I mean, uh, even in Italy, China was faster than Germany in Italy during its darkest time when Italy was struggling with the pandemic last year. So everything is a symbolic politics, but uh, with, an, with its effect and it will have a sustainable uh, uh, moment when, when uh, it comes to uh, the economic and uh, political expansion and so on. So health is just one domino uh, within all this strategy of expansion. As the global scramble worsens, some low-income countries worry about getting left behind and are striking out on their own, making deals where they can. Here's a report from Honduras. Honduras, a country with over 9.5 million people and more than 3,700 COVID deaths. So far, few vaccines have been administered. In March, the country is set to receive 25,000 doses of the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine. That's thanks to COVAX, a UN initiative that uses money from rich countries to enable delivery of vaccines to less wealthy countries. The goal is to immunize a fifth of their populations by the end of the year. Honduras itself hardly has the means to place orders. We have to go begging internationally. Why? Because Honduras is a poor country that has to use its money for other things, unfortunately. So there's not enough to place orders with Pfizer. It's the rich countries that have practically monopolized this vaccine. Developing countries are simply left behind without access to the COVID-19 vaccine. Is vaccine equity being hindered by the greed of rich countries? Dr. Montgomery, devil's advocate question. Is it really greed? Rich countries provided billions in support to the pharmaceutical companies to help them develop these vaccines. Is it not to some degree justified that they say, hey, we'd like to get first dibs on the result? Well, the justification of that has to be judged by others. But it is normal that people who invest a lot of money into the, the security of their own population do that first. We have to make sure that once they can, they extend the solidarity to others. And I think WHO is the right organization to do that. And the COVAX uh, initiative is the right uh, initiative to make sure to provide this in our own interest, because this is something which we forget in, uh, in European countries, that it's our own interest to be able to travel to these countries. There is this wonderful word of uh, the French word of cordon sanitaire, which we have to have around us. And I think a sanitary uh, that is cordon, a safety buffer. A, a safety yeah. buffer around us. So it's in our own interest to extend a solidarity, a hand of solidarity to these countries. Let me ask you very briefly, um, the AIDS model in which patent protection was lifted or to some degree modified in order to ensure that crucial medications could be produced and sold at reasonable cost in the global south. Do we need something like that here? And if so, who drives that? I mean, the, it, at, <laughs> a very difficult question, because at present time, when we are still in, uh, in the phase of scientific innovation, you would immediately take out uh, the incentive uh, for pharmaceutical companies uh, to invent uh, new strategies. In AIDS, we could lift up the patents uh, and, and other things once the innovative part of uh, the scientific uh, investment uh, investigation was over. So I, I, I'm sure one day we will be able to do similar things, but it's too early for that. Otherwise, we'd lose the incentive of pharmaceutical industry, and it would be worth another uh, another um, 
another a full discussion like this uh, just to talk on the incentives of pharmaceutical industry. I think that would be very interesting. I hope we have the chance to do that. But right now, let me go very quickly to Brussels. We're almost out of time. If you look at the reality on the ground, uh, Alexandra, when you see this COVAX initiative that was supposed to ensure equitable access to all, would you say it's just become a fig leaf? Yeah, I have to say uh, it's really it's not going to help anyway. It doesn't have enough money right now. It's uh, only uh, aimed to providing vaccines to 182 countries. That's not going to be enough. We have to do better. McConnell, last word to you. Uh, our title asks whether the vaccine uh, scramble will continue a battle between rich and poor. What do you think? Well, I mean, um, you already uh, uh, said uh, either agreed into that. Uh, I don't think it's a pure greed, but I think there is a lot of ego. There is a, a very nationalistic approach to, to this situation. And that is something which leads us to a, a, a next lockdown, perhaps in the longer term. So if you want to break out of the long, uh, break, um, lockdown, we have to open the strategy. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks to you out there for tuning in.